Hi everybody, Mr. Poser, your AP Bio teacher here. Today we are continuing our second unit on the cell structure and function by discussing topic 2.3, which is cell size. And absolutely, size matters, otherwise we wouldn't be talking about it, right? But a cell's size is really a big factor in determining its ability to exchange materials with its environment. So as I put on this page as a little introduction, all cells are dependent on exchange of materials with their environment. They need to A, obtain nutrients in order to build macromolecules and extract energy and build ATP and metabolize. They need to eliminate their waste, so they need to get rid of what's inside them and put it back out into the environment, and they need to gain or lose energy. Um, so say, for example, a cell needs to dissipate thermal energy that's produced as a result of several metabolic reactions. If there's a reaction that releases an, you know, a net uh, release of heat, it needs to be able to get rid of that energy somehow. Um, so the cell's size plays a big factor in its ability to exchange with the environment. And what I'm going to take you here to is my own illustration, uh, very detailed, right? of why cell size might be a factor. So take a look at these two cells. We have a small cell and a large cell, and they are relatively the same shape. And shape is going to matter here in a minute. I'm going to talk about that. Um, but as I put down here, cells rely upon a diffusion or the movement of a substance from a high to low concentration to exchange with their environment. We're going to be talking about diffusion a lot later in this unit. Um, but what you need to know right now is that it's basically the same process by which if you put a drop of food coloring in a glass of water, that that food coloring will eventually spread out evenly within that water, and then the whole water will become red or whatever color you picked, right? Um, but here's the thing about diffusion. It tends to be kind of slow, right? So if you put that drop of water, excuse me, drop of food coloring in the water, um, and you don't stir it or anything, it's going to take a while for that drop to fully dissipate um, and spread out and diffuse within that glass of water. And cells are pretty reliant on this property called diffusion, the natural movement of a substance from a high concentration to a low concentration. So it's a high concentration when it's in that drop, and it's a low concentration when it's in the water, right? So nutrients that we have outside of these cells here, let's just say it's like glucose or something, both of these cells need to take in those nutrients. And if they're relying upon diffusion, that could take a while. That you know, if it's not helped along, then it could it could take quite a bit of time. This process can be slow. Nutrients may not reach the place they need to go in time in a large cell. So let's just say I'm going to pretend here that, you know, I got a mitochondrion right over here in the middle of the cell. Uh, well, it's more like where the nucleus would be, but who cares? Um, it's going to take a long time for these nutrients to go reach it all the way over to this mitochondrion. But it's not going to take as long of a time in this smaller cell for those nutrients to reach the mitochondrion simply because the cell is smaller, right? So this cell is going to be more efficient at exchanging with the environment than this cell simply because it's smaller, right? But what does being smaller have to do with, you know, other cells. There are big cells. In fact, you have a the biggest cell in your body is the length of your thigh. It's a it's a neuron. It's the uh, what was that? The femoral nerve is actually just one cell. So cells can be big, but why aren't all cells big? Well, it has to do with this exchange in the environment. A cell with a smaller volume will be better equipped to exchange materials. It has less space inside it, and in, and if we're relying upon that simple diffusion in order to eliminate waste and obtain nutrients, it's going to take a long time. So it's better to be smaller in the case of cells. All right. This is why cells can't really grow that big. But cells can be big. They can be big. And how is that? Well, cells, some cells are specialized to be better equipped to exchange materials. Now, what is it about? Obviously, you know, it's got a different shape, right? What is it about this cell, what property of this cell makes it better equipped to exchange materials within with the environment than say this cell? Let's just say let's just say they're the same volume, they're the same size, but what about the shape of this is going to make it better at exchanging with the environment? Let's find out. Well, cells ability to exchange materials is dependent on what we call a surface area to volume ratio. So this cell has, obviously it has these little fringes over here that we're going to talk about what, they, what those are in just a minute. Um, but what these fringes do 
is they increase the surface area of that cell. Okay? So this cell from before, it did not have that much surface area. It's mostly flat. There's a couple curves here. Um, but this cell is going to be much better at exchanging with the environment because it has more surface that can exchange with the environment. And so the more surface area a cell has, typically the better it is at exchanging with its environment. And since cells in your in the human body are specialized for certain, well, for very specific functions, some cells that are, you know, dependent on exchanging with the environment, they're going to have these little fringes. They're called microvilli. I'm going to talk about them in a minute. Um, but surface area to volume is going to become very, very important. And the higher a surface area to volume ratio is for a cell, the better it will be at exchange, exchanging. So something that they're going to ask you to do on the AP exam, check it out. We have to calculate surface area to volume of some various shapes. Okay, so some some cells within your human body they are kind of cube shaped. There are there are cuboidal cells in your body. Now they're not like perfect cubes, but they're they're close enough, right? Um, so what we're going to be doing, as I said, is calculating surface area to volume ratio. Um, and here's the equations that we're going to be using: a volume of a cube, surface area of a cube. Um, and in order to you know be able to uh, solve for both of those, we need to know the length of a side, which is s. Um, so our first example here that we're going to run through is a cube with a side length of 5 micrometers and that little upside down like U looking thing, upside down H maybe, I don't know. Um, that is mu and that means micrometers. So um, you are going to get these equations on the AP exam. You do not, do not have to memorize these equations and you're going to get them on your test as well. All right, uh, you just need to be able to calculate surface area to volume ratio. So let's do this thing. Um, if our surface or if our cell side length is five micrometers in order to calculate the volume we have to substitute five for s so it becomes five cubed and our surface area is going to be six times five squared so we have to solve for each of those separately and then we calculate that ratio so i encourage you if you have a calculator out right now while you're watching this video please use it and follow along and maybe pause the video before i reveal the answers to these just to make sure that we are on the right track all right, um, so if we calculate 5 cubed and 6 times 5 squared, we get 125 is 5 cubed and 150 is the surface area. And this is uh, micrometers squared and this is micrometers cubed, right? Okay, so in order to calculate surface area to volume ratio, all we have to do is divide the surface area by the volume. And if we do that, we go 150 divided by 125 and we get a ratio of 1.2 for this cube-shaped cell with a side length of five micrometers, all right? So that doesn't mean much right now, right? So let's run through another example. All right, let's just say, obviously this is not to scale, let's just say we have another cell that has a side length of 50 micrometers. Let's calculate that. Um, I'm actually not gonna walk you through this, okay? Calculate the surface area to volume ratio. I encourage you to pause the video and try this for yourself before you move forward. Um, again, volume of a cube, S cubed, Surface area is SA equals 6 times S squared. Okay, pause the video, see if you can't calculate it for yourself. One. Okay, hopefully you paused it. Let's go. All right, so V, to calculate volume, we just had to go 50 cubed, and that ends up being 125,000 micrometers cubed, and then the surface area ends up being 6 times 50 squared, which is, ends up being 15,000. Hey, this is already very, very different, right? So if you divide surface area by volume, 15,000 divided by 125,000, we end up getting a ratio of 0 0.12, 0 0.12. So think about that. If the side length is 10 times larger of this cell than the, the smaller cell that we had before, okay, it's going to be 10 times less efficient at exchanging materials with its environment than the smaller cell. So again, illustrating that point, surface area to volume ratio is going to be the factor when it comes to exchanging with its environment. And smaller cells tend to have a better surface area to volume ratio. Look, it's 10 times more effective. All right, excellent. So we're gonna run through a few more examples here. What if we have a sphere-shaped cell? A sphere-shaped cell. Um, and how we're calculating the volume of sphere is volume equals 4 thirds pi r cubed and the surface area is 
SA equals 4 pi R squared. All right. Um, so those are our formulas. Again, you do not need to uh, memorize those and then to find the surface area to volume ratio, just divide surface area by volume. All right, so if our radius is six micrometers, what are we going to do in this situ situation? Uh, we're going to sub in six for R, so we're going to calculate four thirds pi times six cubed to get the volume, and we're going to calculate four pi six squared um, to calculate the surface area. All right, punch those into your calculator if you have not done that already. Pause the video if you must. One, two, three, pause. Okay, let's keep going. Um, the volume ends up being 288 pi, and the surface area ends up being 144 pi. Now, if you punch this into your calculator, you know, you, you're probably going to, you know, pi is an irrational number, so you'll probably end up with an irrational number. Okay, but our purposes here, okay, you can just leave pi as pi. Okay, it, 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 it works either way, and it's way easier to calculate the ratio um, if you just leave pi as pi. Okay, so um, multiply all the other rational numbers in order to get 288 times pi. 144 times pi. Okay, so with that, again, we divide surface area by volume, and what do we get? It's 144 pi divided by 288 pi, ends up being 0 0.50 as our surface area to volume ratio for this 6 micrometer radius sphere. All right, so 0.5 is our uh, ratio there. So how about if the radius, we increase that to 30 micrometers? So we have a cell that's five times bigger. Um, when it comes to its radius. So go ahead, pause the video again, calculate the volume, surface area, and the surface area to volume ratio of this cell. One, two, three, pause. Okay, hopefully you worked it out by yourself. Let's do it. So volume is 4 thirds pi times 30 cubed, and we end up with 36,000 times pi. Um, and then our surface area is 4 pi times 30 squared, and we get 3,600 pi. And what happens here again is our surface area to volume ratio, it is 0 0.10. All right, if we divide 3,600 divided by 36,000, we get, you know, one-tenth. Okay, so there's our surface area to volume ratio, and here it is once again showing you that a smaller cell, if we're talking about two cells of the same shape, the smaller cell is going to have the surface area to volume ratio that's better for exchanging with the environments. And so again, I put down here a higher surface area to volume ratio equals a better exchange of materials and energy with its environment. All right, so how do bigger cells overcome this predicament? Well, bigger cells are specialized to obtain nutrients and eliminate waste. Um, so I highlighted this term up here. They're called microvilli. And what I put on my little little cell that I drew earlier, the little fringes, those are called microvilli. And these are surfaces that are absolutely, they are structure, they are designed for exchange with the environment, right? So this cell, you know, it might be pretty big, but it has these microvilli that greatly, greatly, greatly increase its surface area. So imagine this cell, this is the kind of cell that you might see lining your intestine. Um, and what do, your, what do your intestines do? Well, you eat food, and it travels all the way through your digestive system and your stomach breaks it down and you know chewing it and doing all that stuff breaks it down right but the other thing that your digestive system has to do is absorb absorb nutrients from what you ate and that happens within your intestines so why is it ideal that your intestinal cells or the cells that, that form your intestinal lining have these microvilli well it's really really good for exchanging materials and obtaining those nutrients from what we call the intestinal lumen, from the insides of your intestines, right? So those cells are designed for extracting the most uh, nutrients and materials from your food or what is left of your food as possible. All right, so you have cells actually all over your body that have these microvilli, um, and they're designed for surface area increase. Um, and another example of how some certain membranes are um, structured for more increase and more uh, exchange with their internal or external environment. The Christi in the inner mitochondrial membrane, we talked about this in our last topic, they greatly increase the surface area, right? So why this cell membrane on the inside is all windy and convoluted, it's because it increases the surface area of that inner membrane. 
and once that has more surface area, it's able to produce more ATP. It's better access to um, the intermembrane space. It has better access to uh, the nutrients in the matrix and in the intermembrane space that allow the mitochondria to make more ATP. All right, so it's all about efficiency here. And again, more surface area to volume ratio, higher equals better exchange and more efficient um, exchange with the environment. And that's what's important. One of the things that Im is important for cell survival and cell function. All right, that'll be it for this video. Please let me know if you have any questions. 2.4, we're getting into the plasma membrane. All right, bye everybody.